Okay, hey, what's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Welcome back to the Evercast, a very brief video podcast that I do on my day off talking about things that I would like to talk about and maybe answering a few viewer questions as well. I want to start off opening monologue today uh, recommending the ancient practice of Lectio Continua to you, <clears throat> not only as a Bible reader, but especially for those of you who happen to be preachers. Lectio Continua is the uh, ancient practice of reading through entire books of the Bible at a time, or especially preaching through entire books of the Bible at a time. Now, let me give you a little historical context of here. Of course, uh, the idea of a lectionary goes back many, many centuries. Um, <clears throat> the Anglican Church has a great lectionary in the Book of Common Prayer, and the point of a lectionary is uh, it's, a, it's a set of suggested or required readings for services or for individual devotions that basically take you through the whole scope of the scripture in about a year or a couple of years or, or a series of maybe three years. And it's a sampling of, of readings of various uh, books of the Old and New Testament such that you get a broad spectrum of the whole history of redemption if you follow the lectionary. Okay, so a lot of churches, even today, they'll follow what's called the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a more modern uh, lectionary setup in which the preacher essentially preaches what the suggested passage is for that day. So uh, some traditions, like the Anglican tradition, uh, maybe some Lutherans as well, the, you would expect to hear the, the preacher, uh, the priest, the bishop, whatever, preach from the reading of the lectionary for that given day. <clears throat> now that has given way, of course, to uh, the evangelical world where we don't tend to follow electionaries or any guidance, really, for that matter. Uh, part of the problem with the evangelical world is that uh, it's kind of like the last verse in the book of Judges where everybody does whatever they wanted to do. And so today, one of the more common ways of preaching is to preach a series, a topical series, you know, six weeks on marriage or eight weeks on parenting or, um, you know, four weeks on how to be a better Christian in the workplace, those kinds of series. Uh, those have become very popular, especially in megachurch settings. Um, and I'm sure there are some strengths and some weaknesses to that. But Lectio Continua is what I want to recommend today. And that's the idea of preaching through entire books of the Bible, essentially chapter by chapter and passage by passage. Now, going back to the history of the Reformation, it was the Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli, who's kind of a neat guy, died in battle. Interesting story. He's a contemporary of Martin Luther who during the Swiss Reformation, again, very, very contemporaneous with Martin Luther, uh, he began preaching through the Gospels. And if I'm not mistaken, he picked Matthew's Gospel as his first book. And as he's throwing off some of the false doctrines of Rome, he has a desire for the people to, again, have to hear and to understand the Word of God, which, of course, is the undergirding principle of all Reformation Protestantism. A sola scriptura, right? So he begins preaching through books of the Bible, starting with Matthew, this verse, and then this verse, and then this paragraph, and this paragraph, and this paragraph, all the way through. It took him a long time to do it, as of course it would with a 28-chapter book like Matthew. Uh, to preach every pericope or a section would take quite a long time. And uh, that's one of the challenges, of course, with Lectio Continua preaching. But it also has some advantages as well, and it is for those reasons that I want to commend that practice. If anybody happens to be a preacher who's listening today, I would commend to you Lectio Continua as your preaching methodology. Here's why. First of all, we're going to give our congregation a full understanding of an actual book of the Bible. Uh, let's say it's the book of Romans. Well, that's an interesting suggestion because preaching through the book of Romans in its entirety has led to revival many times in uh, church history. Um, interesting that whenever the book of Romans is exposited with all of its great and glorious doctrines centered in the gospel of Christ, boom, you have these little pockets of revival happening. So there you go. Well, why does that follow? Well, because when we preach the whole counsel of God, as Paul recommended to the Ephesians in Acts chapter 20, uh, we tend to cover the things in preaching books of the Bible that we might ordinarily be tempted to skip. Okay, now I'm a pastor. Some of you are preachers as well. And if you're not, you probably don't understand the tension that we preachers feel when we're in the pulpit. Uh, believe it or not, we're human beings and we sometimes are tempted to want to say things that people like. Okay, that's a temptation. Well, we need to be very careful with that in the pulpit because ultimately our goal is to say what the scripture says. 
And so when we preach Lectio Continua through books of the Bible, we end up having to deal with the passages that, you know, we might kind of want to skip over, like things on God's wrath or the blood of, of Christ or the urgency of, of holiness in the Christian's life. I remember when I was uh, preaching through 1 Corinthians, did the whole book, pretty much every chapter, pretty much every paragraph uh, for the most part. I um, had to come across some difficult things that honestly is like, oh man, do I want to preach this today? Do I really want to preach the women be silent in the church passage? Well, being a Lectio Continua preacher, you have to deal with those things. And it is in unfolding the counsel of God to the people of God that we often see the Spirit of God moving in the most dynamic ways when we quit being cowards and preach what the Bible actually says in those passages. Okay, So the first thing is about Lectio Continua, <clears throat> my people are going to get a broader context of a book. They're going to understand a book, whether it's Galatians or whether it's First Timothy or Ephesians. I want them to see how the pieces fit together. Okay, I don't want to just put little pieces of the puzzle around the edges and have them guess at the center. I want them to see how an entire book, whether it's Romans or Deuteronomy or Genesis, fits together and holds as a whole. Okay, Lectio Continua does that. Uh, secondly, it prevents me from skipping over the difficult passages, okay? Then it would be easier to skip over this passage or that, uh, but Lectio Continua forces me to do that. And then third of all, it also prevents me from uh, riding my favorite hobby horses. Now, as a preacher, we all have our favorite hobby horses, okay? Whether your favorite doctrine is, you know, baptism or, or whether it's... Um, predestination or whether you you love the epistles but you're not so much interested in Leviticus, whatever it is, uh, we all have our favorite passages, our go-to passages. And some of the reasons we like those go-to passages is that we've preached them before and we're pretty good at it. Okay, And so given myself, I would probably just stick with the themes that I like, that I understand, that I've been able to explain easily enough the sermons that people have said, hey, good job, that was a nice one. But Lectio Continua forbids me to do that as a pastor. I can't ride my favorite hobby horse every week. And if you have a pastor that keeps saying the same things over and over again, it's like I've heard that story. The reason you feel like you've heard that story is you have heard that story. Um, Lectio Continua forces you out of that comfort zone as a preacher. And so that ultimately is a very good thing. Now, what should I do if I'm not a preacher and I'm listening to this and my preacher isn't preaching Lectio Continua? Well, you can ask. You could simply ask. Uh, pastors are people too, and sometimes a nice request comes through as, as very sincere. You could say, hey, preacher, why don't you preach through this whole book and deal with every passage? Maybe he's never thought about that before. And maybe he's so given to the modern evangelical six sermon series that he doesn't know how to break out of it, but he should. And I think the people will be greatly blessed for it. Okay, so you can read your Bible Lectio Continua. You can preach your Bible, Lectio Continua, and it's a very good thing when we do. One thing, somebody will say, well, what about Spurgeon? He didn't do it. Cool. Spurgeon didn't do it. No, he did not. He picked his favorite verses, uh, and he got right to Christ in every single verse, whether he was preaching from Song of Solomon or Deuteronomy or Genesis or Nahum or Habakkuk or Matthew or Ephesians or Acts. Uh, Spurgeon always got straight to the gospel, and we can respect him for that. But he was also a genius, okay? And I'm not, and you're not. Probably not a lot of geniuses watching this podcast, otherwise you'd be watching something else. Uh, Spurgeon was an unqualified genius, and we shouldn't hold uh, geniuses up to our standard of practice. He could do some things that you can't, but maybe you can do some things that he, that he wouldn't either. So even though Spurgeon didn't preach Lectio Continua, you probably can and should. Uh, Edwards did from time to time, not always. There were some times where he would uh, preach through a book, but there were many times that he did not. He would sometimes preach one chapter and do many sermons in a series like his uh, series, Heaven is a World of Love. Charity and the Fruits, actually, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, but sometimes he did, not always. I think it's a good good thing to do. Okay, uh, that's enough of that. Um, let me go now to a quick ministry update. This Sunday at Faith Church, we ordained new elders and deacons to the ministry. Very exciting. Uh, happened to also finish up our Lectio Continua series on First Peter, and we finished up with chapter 5. Um, interesting that God would coordinate that. I wish I could say I was genius enough to plan it, um, but 1 Peter 5 perfectly aligns with Ordination Sunday because of Paul's, uh, excuse me, Peter's uh, 
challenge to uh, the elders of the church to shepherd the flock, the pl- flock, flock faithfully. I'll get that out the third time. Shepherd the flock faithfully. Uh, that message is going to be up on YouTube, but it will be delayed because there was a problem with the video. It'll be audio only. So if you want to head over to the Faith Evangelical Presbyterian Church page, you can follow along with the finishing up of that series. A um, couple questions. Viewer questions. I'd like to take a couple viewer questions. Uh, a viewer whose name is Hong Han, hope I'm saying that correctly, asked me about expository preaching, especially with reference to Judges chapter 8. He asked for some help on how to outline that passage. How do you do expository from a narrative? Well, um, here's what I would say about narrative passages. Whenever you preach a narrative passage, you should illuminate it with doctrine or principles. And the converse is also true. Whenever you preach doctrine or principles, you should illuminate it with narrative. Um, Those two things tend to go well together. So when you're preaching a narrative, like this particular passage in Judges, I would say look for the big controlling idea, the main central principle. In this case, it would be God's sovereignty and power as over against man's own strength. And so the main principle in this passage um, is that God can do all things, And it's better to be among the faithful few than it is to be uh, amongst the mighty many. Uh, So I would do something like that. So illuminate narrative with doctrinal, um, doctrinal assertions. And when you preach doctrine, like Ephesians or something like that, illuminate it with narrative uh, illustrations from the Old Testament or the New Testament. Okay. Um, let's see, one other question. Follow up on joy. Okay, so last week, if you watched, I talked about joy and Jonathan Edwards. And I had a great viewer comment from somebody who said, Hey man, love the fact that you led with your own struggle to find joy. Uh, you opened up, you shared from the heart, you talked about your struggle to find joy, your quest for it. And then you got to Edwards and you never came back and finished up the story with your own heart. So what happened? Okay, well, Uh, I'll say this, after I finished my dissertation on joy and happiness from Jonathan Edwards, um, I still continued to search for joy. Uh, I found it. I found it in Christ. I know it's there. But as a mortal, as a fleshly person made out of dust, uh, every day I'm choosing between the joys of this world and eternal joys in Christ. But I understand it better. And I think that's part of the fight, isn't it? Um, When we're fighting for joy, when life hurts, when the struggles of difficulties of trials come up, at least I know what I'm fighting for. I know where ultimate joy is. It's in Christ and Christ alone. And therefore, knowing that, we are less likely to be deceived and to chase after the false pursuits. So I can't say, and I wish I could, but I can't say, yes, now that I've mastered Edwards' unhappiness, I now know everything about joy and happiness, and I've attained it. I have attained self-actualization in this category. Uh, I no longer need to pursue the fruit of the spirit of, of joy. But that would, not be, that would not be true. I know where joy is found. It's found in Christ. But like you, uh, like all of us, uh, there are times where I battle blue, the blues. I battle uh, different struggles. I, I battle stress. I battle frustration, just like you do. But, but here's the deal. Um, we know where it is, don't we? And that's what that's what distinguishes us from the unbelievers. Is that the unbelievers are like are like blind people groping around trying to find anything that will bring happiness. We Christians, we already have it. We have it through the power of the Spirit. We know joy is in the Word of God. And though we may struggle from day to day, at the end of the day, we know exactly where that great, sustaining, eternal happiness is found, and it's found in nowhere else but the gospel. Well, thanks for checking in today. I love you lots. Hope this series has been helpful to you. Um, If it has, then feel free to like and subscribe. If not, no big deal. Lots of good stuff on the internet. Uh, This is just one of those things that is out there. Uh, It'd be cool if you'd subscribe to the Faith Church Sermon page where you can hear my regular preaching. Also, I'll post a link to the, uh, the Joy Edwards book in the description of this video. Again, thanks for checking in. Love you lots, and we'll talk to you next time. Have a great day.